fingers and hope for the best. Okay, let's go ahead and start on down here. Welcome back. Uh, today we are going to go ahead and tackle several different topics. What we really want to do today more than anything is we want to kind of push ahead with the whole idea of rendering. And what we really want to do is a little bit more to the exteriors. In addition to what we've looked at in the past, we're going to talk a little bit about more where you get some side objects and objects to sort of make your renderings a little bit richer. Go ahead and fill out the model and give it a little context to help people understand what it is you're rendering. We're also going to go ahead and take a look at the issue of the sun, where the sun is in the sky and how we can have, the, rather than just sort of putting it at a single point in the sky, how we can actually do sun studies that say over time, through a single day, look at how the sun is changing and the shadows are changing in response to it, or even through a year, how we can go ahead and just take into account really how that sun positioning changes throughout the year and then how that affects our building itself. Okay, so we'll start with some exterior things. We will then move over to the interior of the building and really we'll look at sunlighting again but from a different angle. From the inside of the building, what we want to look at is the sun that's coming in through the windows and how we have to do two things. One is really adjust our rendering so that that sun doesn't overpower what's happening inside the building because it's so, so bright compared to the, compared to the interior lighting that it will often just wash out the subtle distinctions you actually want to see inside of it. We'll also find out a little bit about how we can really set the rendering settings up a little bit, kind of change them so that we can bounce that light off of the walls is it sort of fill in the spaces, okay, as opposed to doing everything with artificial lights. So we'll spend some time looking at interior renderings and really how they get enhanced to go through and take advantage of the light available. Then we're going to finish up today with walkthroughs, that notion of really, rather than having a single static camera and rendering that, how we can actually push a camera through a path and then record a movie to kind of show you moving along that path, okay? So let's go ahead and get started. Before we dive on into the material, I just want to kind of point out a couple things that are happening out there on the coursework website. One thing that's kind of a nice new enhancement is the TAs have gone ahead and put together a Google schedule, which replaces the calendar that was been set up in coursework. It's a little bit better in terms of how things are set up. We can actually again record the different hours, who's going to be available during, e during each of those different class times or those different sessions. So you can sort of see that at the end of this week, starting uh, tomorrow and then like through the weekend, as well as all through the week, we have a lot of different class times set up for office hours. I'll go ahead and add my office hours in here again too. What I'll probably do is again be here on Tuesday night and also on Thursday night and probably some on Wednesday during the day. We'll just kind of fill that all in. So there should be a lot of opportunities for you to go ahead and get some things done. We'll also spend some time on Tuesday in class, give you some time that if you've done some work on your renderings before then, we'll take some time in class debugging some of those problems because I am just betting that many of you will be having the same problems because it sort of works that way. We all run into very similar walls and we learn a little bit by seeing the other walls that people have run into and oh, that looks an awful lot like something I'm doing. So the class schedule is going to be out there. Let's go ahead and take a look at class videos. If you are keeping up with us that way, we are now up through last session, session nine, parts one, two, and three. I just kind of keep on trying to put these things out there. So if you miss anything in class, know that's available as a resource for you. You can get those as podcasts or just watch them on the computer, really whatever you want to in terms of uh, trying to catch up on some stuff. And that's what this microphone's all about and why I'm wandering around with uh, the extra wires and stuff like that. We record it in class. Hopefully don't make too many mistakes. Edit out the really bad ones because I don't want them immortalized for all time and then put them up there for you to share. So that's what's happening. Okay, let's go over to where we want to be today. And that is to start by looking at just renderings and the whole workflow of what you need to do to make successful renderings. And it all really starts with this notion of you create your model. That's what we've been working on for the last several weeks. You create your building elements. We've been playing around a little bit with adding contextual elements, furniture and people and vehicles and plants and things that really just help flesh out the model and kind of give it a little more reality. And last time we learned a lot about materials and how we can sort of assign materials and even sort of create some of our own materials. And that's all the first step. We start with all that. We also define some 3D views and cameras of the model. Okay, that's so we can just sort of set up views that we want to go through and render. And then we try rendering them. And the important thing to know about your renderers, renderings is that as you create them, they're static images. When you render something, that little image is really locked into time. It is just a little static, cannot change, it's always going to look like that. 
So even as you go back and make changes to the model elements, or you change the materials, or change the lighting around, that static rendering is going to stay the same. And you just need to re-render. Okay, so just watch out for that. That's one of the few things about Revit that is static. If it's in a rendering, that's really just a snapshot. Okay, and it won't update itself. After we go through and create a static image, usually we test some out. We can fine tune the model, and then we typically come back and re-render it a second time, and we iterate until we finally get what we want. Important to note, there really is no absolute right answer with rendering, like a lot of things. You just sort of get it to the point where it's good enough to show you what you were after, okay, and then you sort of stop. So think about what your rendering is going to be used for. If all you're really trying to do is understand the shadows that are being cast on your building or that you're casting on another or the lighting coming through the windows, you probably don't need to do that at an incredibly fine resolution to sort of understand what the impact of the shadows is going to be. Okay? So you might stop earlier in the process if you're after just the shadow information. If you really want to understand the impact of, oh, some sort of li uh, lighting effect or some sort of material that's being used and you really care about the look of birch wood versus pine wood versus walnut or mahogany, then you'll probably need to render it in a lot more detail okay? and keep on going. So always be aware of really what the answer is that you're trying to get out of the rendering okay? and then sort of ratchet it accordingly. Often, for my own internal use, I do things at a higher or a lower level of resolution, kind of a little bit rougher, but then right before I want to share it with a planning review board or the clients, I'll ratchet it up at that point and really get a lot finer because they care about seeing it at that level. Okay, as we go through and we do our renderings, um, the first step was really this whole thing about adding the realism and context. So I just want to point out some of the places that you can get different pieces. The furniture components, most of you are doing really good in terms of that. You've been putting them in on assignments one and two. Yeah. There are libraries of out there. There's the Imperial, li Imperial Library available. That's OK. There's also things out on Revit City. And I haven't forgotten, I'm still going to put together a list of all the places you can download some other things. So there are a lot of other places we can go out and get nice pieces of furniture on the web. If you go out to the 110 library, which is available on these machines, and it's also available on the K drive if you want to download it to your own machine, Okay, or from somewhere else on campus, okay, it's available out there, and there's a library furnishings, which is full of all sorts of stuff that I use for my own rendering. So I share everything that I use in my own work kind of as part of that library with you. There's also something called the Modern Medium Library, which is out there too, and it has a library full of furnishings too. Yes? Can you tell me how to get to that shade drive one more time? Sure. Let's go ahead. Are you coming at it from a Mac or a PC? Uh, PC. Okay. Parallels. Okay, what you're going to do is actually let's start on out here and let me see if I can get to the finder. Because first we've got to get it hooked in and then we'll go from there. Okay. Oh, then it's more the other way. <laughs> no worries. We're adaptive. Okay, let's go ahead and put this down for a minute. There I have my little PC environment hanging around back there in the background. The way you get to the K drive or the L drive is as follows. It actually has a little URL associated with it that look like this. It is CEE server, and then CEE 110 apps is what I call the K drive. CEE 110 files is the L drive. But if you choose that, or you type it all out, we'll do it that way, since you probably won't have it in there. So that URL. Notice I'm not in Internet Explorer, I'm in File Explorer at the higher level. When you say return, it'll connect out through the Windows network. Now, this will work if you're in the building. It'll work if you're on campus, because the campus network can see the local servers here. If you're off campus, if you're down in San Jose or somewhere else and you need to get in, you need to have the virtual private network client installed on your machine to connect you into the campus network. Okay, But you can download that. If you need help with that, I can tell you how to do that later. But then as long as you're using your SUNET ID, you can get on. So you say, great, it wants a password. What do we use? How about CE110 and BMW? And when you do that, it just mounts it on your desktop. So in addition to all my other fun little drives out there, well, I have a bunch of them loaded out here. But it's sort of, well, there it is. It's also under the network tab. Okay. Then underneath there, under apps, this library is hiding around under Revit Libraries. So I have my CE 110 editions. That's where you find the 110 library and modern medium. But even higher up than that, that's where I get those rendering material images. 
and they even have some background images out there. There's a lot of stuff kind of floating around out there. So that's my like master library of all this stuff. I just keep on putting it out there in this drive and sharing it with you. Okay, so that'll get you to the K drive or the L drive. How you make it the K drive is actually you just choose it. It's a volume, and there's a thing under there. Let me try right clicking, see if I can get it that way. There's map network drive. So I can say, take that thing, that volume I've just selected, and make it the K drive. Okay, then that'll show up as K on your desktop. Okay, no worries. The L one, the L one's gonna be so so similar. You're gonna like L. So CE server one ten files. Okay, and then map that to your L drive. It's really amazing. I at home, work on things, throw them up there, and like it sort of works out. If you're on the Mac side and you want to do that same sort of thing, let's yeah, I don't want to discriminate. We'll go over to the Finder. There's this fabulous thing up here called under the Go menu, connect to server. And in the connect to server, you'll see the URL right there. It's SMB CEE server. Notice that the dash or the slashes go in the opposite direction. Look what SMB stands for, it's some protocol. But that'll basically connect you in the same way. So if I say connect it to the CEE server, it'll give you a dialog that looks like this. Again, I'll say CEE 110 BMW, connect it, and then I can choose those things and just put them out on my desktop. Okay, so everyone should be able to get to things. Okay, let's come back over here. So go on out there, grab some furnishings. Go ahead and work with those things, pull them in. Not all objects are created equal. Some objects are great, and they have all sorts of material settings and type properties. Some objects aren't so great. They're like big gray blobs that have nice shapes, but they don't actually m render as materials very well. Okay, Sometimes I have to go in and edit them to kind of give them materials properties. But if you can't, you know, if the one you have really doesn't look all that great for what you want, throw it out and go ahead and grab something else. Just be very free about that, because it's really just examples. Or go ahead and create your own modeled in place objects that sort of give you the effect you want. Side objects. Side objects were things like, oh, picnic tables and benches and planters and bike racks and things that go outside. And again, in the libraries, you'll find all sorts of things available. So out in the 110 library, you'll find a lot of cool ones. Out in the modern medi medium library, you'll find things including Oh, outdoor furnished vehicles and animals. They have farm animals. So if you really want a chicken or a cow or something like that, they have them out there for you. So uh, go ahead. Okay, people. People show up in uh, several different ways. The best way, though, is RPC people. So let's talk about them. RPC stands for Rich Photorealistic Content. Okay, and what they've done is they've actually they've taken pictures of Yin and Dwayne and Laurent and all these folks like all 360 degrees. So this picture, they took that picture, they took this picture, they took that picture. I'll rotate instead of making the camera rotate. So you get me from all 360 degrees. Okay, then based on that, they store that information and as you place the model, the RPC person in, it'll figure out really what your angle is relative to the photograph and show you the appropriate view. That's why they look so good. They don't look flat. They actually sort of rotate to show you the right thing. So. RPC people, when you put them in there, place them, rotate them to kind of give them the right orientation. Again, the, the, they have a little arrowhead on them, which sort of indicates which way they're, point they're facing. Okay, um, and you can choose an image. You can choose amongst the different types using the type selector. Uh, RPC people, the collection they give you as part of Revit is somewhat limited. You only have that like oh, four or five guys and four or five gals to work with. There are more available out on the library. There's all sorts of good content, excuse me, available on the web, but um, it costs. So that's, you know, they make money by selling these parts. It's a big trade in making these things. So for another $50, you can go ahead and load even more people into your project. Okay, and that sort of works, but you don't necessarily have to. You know, just, you know, we're, we're fine. We're, we'll, we'll live with Tina and Yinyin and Cynthia and all those guys. You know, they're, we're, whatever. Okay. Another way actually to bring those in, I should comment at this point though, and a lot of sort of entourage objects is you can try to bring objects into your model and render them there or into the model, 
Or you can actually just take the image that comes out of the rendering and then take it into a program like Photoshop or some photo editor and layer people in using Photoshop. Okay, and if you're familiar with Photoshop, that'll make sense to you. If you aren't, I'll probably do something special with that to kind of demonstrate that maybe next class. But Photoshop's a very incredibly powerful tool where we can take your image of a building and basically outline it, abstract it from its background, then put it into another image. So I can put it somewhere else on top of a background image. Then I can take images of people that I just uh, cropped out of photographs and put them into the foreground. And an awful lot of architectural work gets done that way. There's just lots and lots of photo uh, Photoshop images, and you kind of just layer them in there. Okay, It's very custom, but you know, sometimes it's actually the easiest way to get what you want. So don't be ashamed to go ahead and you got to use the right tools and mixture media and tools to really get what you want. And Photoshop's one of those tools you should know about. Okay, trees. Let's talk about trees ever so briefly. Trees are also RPC objects, and I'll start there for just a second, just because I want to show you a couple other types of trees. We have the deciduous trees; those are the ones that lose their leaves. We have the conifer trees; those are the ones that are uh, like evergreens, so fir trees and pine trees and things like that. Tropical trees. We didn't play much with tropical trees. I like tropical trees. So since we're here in a tropical climate, let's go ahead and put some tropical trees in just to show you. Oh, where do I want to be? I'm looking back there. I'm trying not to confuse myself. I'll go into Revit 2010. I'm going to open up that same model we worked on last time. You can open up that same model or open up your own model that you're working on. These guys, these are all little RPC objects, so you can choose them. We can take a look at their type properties. We can even look at their render appearance. So a hibiscus tree or a hibiscus plant, eh, it's a little hard to see what's going on in there. It's green and has little flowers on the ends of it. Okay, we can go ahead and create some new ones. Again, I can duplicate. And if I want to make, oh, a hibiscus, which is 10 feet big instead, I'll change its height to 10 feet. I'll leave it set to hibiscus, or I could turn to something else. Maybe duplicate that. I'm going to go ahead and create a crepe myrtle or something like that, which is also going to be 10 feet big. Again, I'm going to leave it at 10 feet. And I'll just change its properties to be well, a honey myrtle. Wrong type of myrtle, but it'll work. Say OK. And now I've got different sort of plants. Notice these little grayed out images sort of adjust according to the type, try and give you something that's you know, about appropriate for what you've selected. Okay, I'm going to go out to the other view. And that whole issue of the palm trees, let me just do that real quickly. In the back of the parking lot there, let me put a couple palm trees. I'll say, let's go ahead, we'll place a component. What I need to do is actually load the palm tree component. So under planting. You'll find, oh, here are my tropical trees. Oh, that's tropical plants, smaller things like cacti and, oh, just shrubs or things that are not tree height. Let's go to tropical trees. It's going to load it into the project. And then I can take a look at what type of ferns are available. Our tropical trees, we have the Australian tree fern, some bamboo plants. I'm going to do this 25-foot royal palm. I'll just drop a few in here in the back of the parking lot and put one over here. Kay. These guys, oops, put another one over here. They even have a directionality to them also. You notice it has the little arrowhead on the front of it, so you can rotate them around. It's actually kind of helpful to rotate them if you want to have a little variation and not have all your trees casting the same shadows. Okay, all you need to do is grab one of your trees. I'll say, oh, what do I want to do? I want to modify it. I think I want to modify it. Where's my rotate now? Modify planting. There it is. I'll swing an arc. Okay, now they won't look quite the same. So we get them from slightly different angles. Okay, when I render these trees, let's just take a look at what that looks like. I'll go to rendering. Okay, now. Since I'm only interested in those trees right now, I don't really care to sort of render the entire building because I just want to see if those trees look good for what I have in mind. What I'm going to do is just turn on a region so that I don't have to render the entire thing. 
There's the region. It's that big red box. And I'll focus it in like such. Great. And let me zoom on in here. Super. Now let me go ahead and just render these. Oh, I'll render these kind of at a low quality so you get just enough of it. And we'll see how this looks. So this is my basic working method. Don't be afraid to tr you know, put things in there, do a little test rendering, see if that looks right. If you just put in a new couch and you're not quite sure about the material on the couch and you want to tune that, zoom in. Go ahead and just focus on that couch. You don't have to keep on rendering everything that you know already looks OK. It'll save you a lot of time. <laughs> Okay, so those are some trees. Pop back over here for a sec. The next thing we want to talk about is lighting. And really, lighting is where things start to get to be a little bit confusing, not because lighting objects are really all that hard. They do have a couple of nice properties to them, like just really how much light they're casting, so how bright are they, in addition to what material they are, so we can adjust that. But where it gets a little bit confusing is lighting is one of the first places where it's really going to matter what type of light we choose because some lights have a very specific hosting requirement. So let's talk about the different types of lights you have available. The idea is you have some lights which are freestanding, lamps and torchiers and things where they don't really have to be mounted. I can put it anywhere in the room, and there are a lot of those available. We can put them wherever they want in a plan view or in a 3D view, and it's not going to complain. It'll let us. There are some other fixtures that are either wall-hosted or ceiling-hosted, and those we have to pay a little more attention to. Okay, Wall-hosted lights are things like sconces, things that actually physically attach to a wall, okay, and then point up or point down. If you choose a wall-hosted light, you just can't put it in the middle of the room. You have to bring it up against a wall. Okay, Same thing, ceiling-hosted lights. There are some things like, oh, let's take a look at ceiling lights. Like These are ceiling-hosted lights. They're hanging off the ceiling right now. Okay, so in order to put those into our project, we need to have a ceiling to stick them to. Okay, so we have these type of lights, some common ceiling lights, or these are pendant lights. They're hanging, okay, with tubes in them that are sort of reflecting up off the ceiling and then bringing light down to us in the room. There's some other lights. If you go wandering around the building, you'll find troffer lights. Those are the lights that are actually, if you kind of could picture one of those two by two squares in the ceiling missing. Okay, and instead of it, a lighting fixture being there, that's called a troffer. It's basically, I'm not sure why it's called a troffer, it's just replacing a piece of ceiling tile and it's up into the ceiling. And the third type of light we often use that's sort of a ceiling light is something called a recessed light or a down light. And it's like a little round circle, it pokes up into the ceiling, there's a spotlight in there that's coming down. Okay, and all these different types of lights are good for different things. For example, these Pendant lights are kind of nice in that they give us kind of a nice warm overall lighting in the room and that what they do is they bounce light off the ceiling, the white ceiling, and then it spreads it out pretty evenly. So as you're moving around, I'm not really casting shadows, not very much. It's sort of just bouncing off the ceiling and just sort of giving us a lot of light to work with. On the other hand, those down lights, those recessed cans, those are nice because they sort of get out of the way, they're up in the ceiling, but they are very good for giving me task lighting Okay. As in, they really brighten up a specific space if I really want to be right here lighting up this keyboard area. Okay. But you have to be a little bit careful about where you put them because they do cast shadows. It's a very direct beam of light. So if you put it in front of me, it's going to look fine in terms of lighting up my hands. But if it's a little bit behind my head, what happens is my head's actually going to cast a shadow on the keyboard. Okay. So you have to be a little bit careful when you're putting down lights in there that you put them in the right places. We tend to like to put down lights and troffers in hallways because what happens is if you're moving a big old object down the hall, you're not going to hit it because it's recessed up into the light. Whereas these pendant lights, they're hanging down here. You might actually damage those. Okay, But you got to start thinking about there's different lights for different purposes. Some lights give you ambient light and overall light. Some lights give you task lights. They're very focused light for right here. Some lights are accent lights, and you really just put them around just so you have a little depth to the lighting, a little variation in the lighting. And what's sort of interesting about as you do your rendering is you can get light into the space, but you're also doing a little bit of lighting design, which really in its own right is the whole separate design discipline. Okay, so you know, don't get overwhelmed by that, but let's yeah, realize there's a lot of power in what we're doing. 
And you know, don't be intimidated if it doesn't sort of give you exactly the effect you want the first time out, because it's a complicated field. So let's go ahead and take a look at lighting and see if I can sort of demonstrate where you get those and how you apply them. Because we're going to need those, especially when we start doing interior things. I'm going to go back to my floor plan view. And you can go to floor plan view in your model, if you like. I'm just going to say make it hidden line. That'll sort of remove a lot of the detail I don't care about seeing right now. And I'm also going to turn off these shadows. OK, and I'm turning off those shadows just because they're sort of slowing things down a bit. We'll talk more about shadows in just a second. But I'm going to focus on this little receiving area in the plan and put some lights over here. So let's take about what we can do. We can go out to a uh, component. I'll say place a component. I don't have any lights in here yet, so I'm going to go out and load some. And if I go to lighting fixtures, you'll find I have some exterior ones and some interior ones. I'm going to start with something really simple, like a floor lamp, this torchier. You know, you know those things that are sort of like those big stick lights that have a light at the top that reflects the ceiling. You pick them up at Walmart. You know, they're kind of torchiers were very popular several years ago because they just throw a lot of light. I'll go ahead and just put one on the floor over here. Notice it'll let me really put it wherever I want to. I'll just put it over here near the end of the desk. Okay, I'll go out and grab another type of light. I've got this little desk area and a little credenza behind it. Let me grab some other light. I'll say load another family. Let me go out to the lighting fixtures. And oh, what will I get? Let's take a look at not pendant, not wall lamp, table lamp. It's an arm lamp. Let me go for a standard one. That kind of looks like it's a little table lamp. I'll put that in here, and I'll just put it over here on the end of the credenza. OK. Now, all these lamps that I'm putting in have properties. Let's take a look at them. I'll get that little lamp that I just put on the credenza. See if I can get to it by tabbing it. There it is. I will say, OK, let's look at its instance properties. It has this issue of really what it's hosted by. And right now, you can see that as I dropped it in, it got picked up on level one by the floor that has the carpet finished. OK, now it has an offset of zero right now. So actually, it's going to be buried. It's on the floor right now. So it's going to be inside the piece of furniture. OK, what I need to do is actually just give it a little of an offset, kind of raise it up a little bit. So I can go out and figure out how high that credenza is. I happen to know it's about 28 inches, so I'm going to put it there. But we can go to an elevation view or another view and sort of measure it and then try and get it on top. But be prepared for that. As you put these things in, they may get buried inside other objects because they're not smart enough to figure out where the tabletop is. It's going to go all the way down to the floor. Kay. Another type of property it has is it has this electrical data. It's 120 volts, and it looks like 60 volt amps, which are watts. There's a type right there. Notice that we actually have a little electrical data on it. So we have 60 watt versions and 100 watt versions in 120 or 277 volts. Okay, 60 versus 100 watts is really going to determine how much light it throws, kind of like putting in a 60 watt or 100 watt bulbs. The other data, 120 volts versus 277, that's really all about more when we're linking them together into an electrical system and trying to really keep track of all the electrical loads. We decide really you know, which type of system we have, whether it's a 120 or a 277 volt system. Here in the US, most of our systems are 120 volt. Okay, commercial systems, and if you're traveling around the world, in Asia, in Europe, we tend to have 220 or 270 volt systems. So it sort of depends where you're from. So every place has its own local standards. We can edit any of those. I can go to the 60 watts. If you really dig on in there, you'll find that that 60 watts, it's actually been computed that for 60 watts and 14.25 lumens per watt, that's what that says, it's going to throw off a certain amount of light. Okay? And if we actually want to go through and change that, we can. For example, if we want to go through and put in there, you know, a 100 watt bulb was good, but I'm going to actually have a 200 watt bulb. So I really want to be able to have a very bright table lamp. I can put that in here. I would come down here, and I could actually change it. Instead of 60 watts, let me make that 200 watts. And I'm not sure if you I should have slowed down and done that a little bit more clearly. Let's go back out again. 
Notice at 60 watts, it's putting out, you can either think about it 855 lumens, or we can think of it as uh, 7.32 lux. But it has a certain efficacy or sort of efficiency for how many lumens it produces for each watt. 855 at 60. If I want to put a 200 watt bulb in there, okay, it'll now be 2850, so quite a bit more. And actually, this data is used computationally. It's not only going to brighten up our rendering, but this is actually really useful when we do a uh, numerical daylighting analysis, because it can actually compute how much daylight is showing up on each of the different surfaces, which is something we ultimately need to provide. So we'll say, OK, it's a 200 watt bulb. That should be fine. Let me change the apparent load to him there also. That way, it'll register properly in the tables. Say OK. OK. So we so far, we have these uh, torchiers, and we have this table lamp. So far, so good? OK, next up, let's go for a wall fixture. That's where it's going to get a little more interesting. I'll go to my components again, and I'll load something in. Let's go to those electrical fixtures, or lighting fixtures, excuse me. What do we have in here? I'll stay away from the floor lamps. I'll go for these things that are called sconce lights, because these sconce lights are actually wall mounted. I really wish, actually, we should just reorganize this library so that these things are grouped into sort of freestanding versus wall versus ceiling. You sort of have to know what's going on. But if you try to put something in and it won't stick or it won't let you place it, chances are you just have the wrong type of hosting. Let me go for this sphere sconce light. It's kind of a big sphere that's a half a sphere that's stuck to the wall. And watch what happens. As I go hovering around all over in space, it won't let me place it. It gives me the no, you cannot place me, let mark. When you get up to a wall, ooh, ah, no, yes. OK, so like that. Maybe I'll put one over on this side, too. Now, this lighting fixture on the wall, it has all the same sort of properties, just like uh, the other ones, if you choose it. You'll see it has 60 watt versions, 100 watt versions. We can sort of control its lighting. Okay, This is actually, I should comment, the maximum lighting capacity for this, 100 watts, like a 100 watt bulb. As we're doing our rendering, you'll see we could actually turn them on or turn them off, and we could also dim them. So we could actually put a dimmer on each of them and then really say that I want to make it 50% of the value, or 100% of the value, or 25% of the value, just like a little sliding dimmer. Okay. So we'll go ahead and change that when we're actually doing the rendering. This is just the actual fixture itself. Okay. Let's go ahead, let's give ourselves a view that lets you see that. Because, oh, you're hanging around and you're sort of probably thinking that you'd like to be able to kind of uh, see all those fixtures in place. I actually have a view that's set up like that. But you can go ahead and create a view if you want to, just a new 3D view. It's called just Toward the Offices. And there it is. What you can see over there in the background is this is that torchier. This is that the wall light that's hanging around here. Let me do this. This view is not really showing me as much of the office as I'd like. So what I'm going to do is do a little walking. Mm, too much walking. Let me rewind that. I can rewind if I go hog wild. Back to that view. Let me try walking again. Walking, you have to sort of be a little subtle about. Let me get down in here. Because you see that little uh, dot? If I, I'm very far above that dot, I'll be walking forward very fast. If I'm very near that dot when I'm holding down, I'm going to be walking slowly. Watch this. If I get a little above, oh, I'm so slow. I can come over here, come over there. If I get below the dot, I'm going backwards. If I get way up here, I'm going outside the building. So let's go back to, I'll rewind again. And we'll try walking slowly again. Just up here. Yep. Beautiful. Okay, That's pretty close to what I want to see. Let me zoom on out a little on ZO to zoom out, because I'm going to stretch the boundary of this up just a hair. So I can see a little more of that ceiling. Let me ZF to zoom to fit there. OK, so you sort of see these lighting fixtures. If those don't look like the right height, let's go through. And 
we'll just change their instance properties and say, you know, maybe I'll make that seven foot eight off the floor instead. Let me make that one up higher too. Height, seven foot eight. I should change the type property. I should have done it as an instance property. So far, so good? Okay. Next up, last but certainly not least, because it's the one that causes all the troubles for people, is ceiling light. So let's talk about that. I happen to actually have a ceiling in this area, so I'm in pretty good shape. We're going to show you what to do if your building doesn't have a ceiling, because a lot of people have nice sloping roofs and you don't have ceilings in there. So we're going to have to do a little faking to go ahead and make it think it has a ceiling. Okay, so let's start with the ceiling area here, then I'll do the faking in just a second. Okay, if I'm gonna place lights on the ceiling, yes? Um, does the floor of the second floor It doesn't. Yeah, it's weird, as we build it, we use it as the ceiling, we just put sheetrock on the bottom and call it a ceiling, but no, it doesn't think of it that way. That's where the rub comes. Okay, so, First thing that's up against us when we're placing ceiling lights is in our plan views, we tend to be looking down at the ground, okay? And ceilings are above us. So plan views aren't the best ones for putting ceiling lights. What you actually want to be doing is looking at a ceiling view instead, which is really like a plan view, just pointed in the other direction. So let's start with that notion. We'll come on over and instead of looking at the floor plans, let's open one of the ceiling plans. This is going to sound really weird. I'm not going to choose the level one ceiling because that's cut at the level one ceiling level looking up. I might be able to see the ceiling there. I probably can. But what I'm going to do is go down to the level one floor and look up the ceiling. Okay, And you can just open it and see if you're seeing what you think you are. That's probably the best way. So here we are. There's that little reception area right here. I don't see the furniture. I do see those wall fixtures because they're sort of above the cut plane. Okay, but I'm gonna put some ceiling lights in this area, right in here. So how do we do that? Let's go out to our components and we'll try to grab some more. Let's place some components and I'll load a family. Oh, the one that I like is this pendant light. Pendant lights, again, like these ones in here, they're hanging from the ceiling, they're a long strip of light. Let's put them in here. And I'll go ahead and put one over here. Okay, and what it's doing is it's hosting on the ceiling. You can actually take a look at its properties. And you'll see that it's actually, it's on that level. It's grabbed up to that. Okay, so they're going to be okay. If you want to see those in the 3D view. There they are. See them hanging up there? Beautiful. Let's go back to the ceiling plan. I'll do something else. We'll put a couple troffer lights in. Again, I'll say component, place the component, load it, lighting fixtures. And troffers are a little bit further down. I get a two by two or a two by four. I'm gonna go two by two, two feet by two feet. And usually what I do is I go dropping them right into the ceiling. If I do a good job, I'll sort of fix it so it's sort of at some nice spacing relative to the grid. It'll look neater that way. But as a first level, let me just put them in there. Okay, there they are. You seen those things? They're, we have them out in the hallway here where they're actually like little, uh, they're like little egg crates that are sort of recessed in there. They have lights up there. Again, we like those since they're recessed up in the ceiling, I can't hit them by accident. They just provide kind of an ambient downlight the last kind of light I'm going to put in there is a down light. So again, I'll go to components, place a component, see what I can find in there. I have spotlights, strip lights, under cabinet lights, wall washers, recessed cans, a bunch of different things. I'm going to put some recessed cans in. In general, oh, what can I tell you about? Spotlights are sort of very narrow beam lights. They, instead of being sort of a when it's a floodlight, they come down in a very narrow beam of light. A wall washer, so you know what that is, that's like up on the wall, it's kind of very close to the edge and casting light at the wall. You often put those over artwork and where you actually want to see sort of the texture of the wall. 
as opposed to being more of a task light. Okay, but just go ahead and play with these a little bit. We will go, well, I'm just going for a recessed can. That's going to be sort of, it'll look like a hole in the ceiling, but it'll have a light in it. Say, okay. And I'll go through, I'll put a couple in front here. Often we put these like in hallways, you can see something like that, kind of spread them out here. This is actually a great time when you're putting recessed ceiling lights, even with most lighting, they tend to be laid out in very regular patterns and grids. So the array tool can really be very helpful to you because you really want to put eight of them down the center of the hallway and not really have to space them out. I'll put one back in here. And let me go back to that office view. Okay, and there's the lighting fixture right in there. Okay, super. So we got those in. Let's go ahead and, for the most part, this is looking pretty good. Let's talk about that case. What do you do when you have a ceiling light but you have no ceiling? Because I think a lot of you have that case, you know, because you have these nice sloping ceiling or sloping roofs and there's no ceiling there. To demonstrate that, I'm going to go over to an area of my plan where I know I don't have a ceiling. And that is, oh, back in the lab area here. In the back corner, I have this little sort of storeroom. And there's no ceiling in there. So if I go through and I try to go through and put some recessed lights, notice that it won't let me. Okay, and this is where a lot of you are probably at this point. Uh, you're at this point right now. You want to put a ceiling light in there, you just can't. Okay, here's what you got to do. It's actually pretty straightforward, but it's got to sort of think outside the box a little bit. This is actually very analogous to what we do. Some people are having the trouble when you put cabinets in. You, cabinets often need a wall to put them on. So if you want to make an island, it's hard since there's no wall to put it on. So what you have to do is make a little sort of thin wall, half inch thick or a thick I inch thick, just to host the cabinets. Okay? We're going to do the same sort of thing here. What we're going to do is we're going to put a little bit of ceiling in there, not for real, but a little bit, just enough to kind of like double stick tape that we can sort of stick it up to. Okay? And that's how we can make this happen. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go over the ceiling tool. And normal my ceiling tool has, well, I have a nice generic ceiling type. That's a good one. It's not too big. I'm going to do a little sketching. I'm going to put in some ceiling. Don't get too worried about it just yet, because we're going to go back and fix it in just a minute. But I'm going to put a ceiling in there. And you say, oh, but I don't want a ceiling there. It's a sloping roof, and I didn't want to put a ceiling in there. Not to worry. Hang on. We're going to say components. Place a component. And I'm going to put some recessed lights in that ceiling. Okay. So far, so good. We got our lights placed. Okay. I'm feeling pretty good. You are not quite feeling good about it yet, though, in that there's so much ceiling. I didn't really want to see that ceiling. I wanted to see the big slope and roof instead of that ceiling. So what do I got to do? It's as follows. I'll grab that ceiling, and I'll edit its boundary. And instead of going ahead and keeping that big old square patch of ceiling, I'm just going to go ahead and say, you know, I would really like the ceiling just to be right behind the light fixture. I'm actually sort of making a piece of ceiling that's made out of like two little pieces. Think of it kind of like this double stick tape that's going to hold the lights to the ceiling, or hold the lights to the roof. Okay, and when I finish that, okay, those lights are now hosted on this ever so small little piece of ceiling, which is really just providing a host for them. Okay, and that's what you got to do for these situations where you don't want to put in a ceiling. So if you've just done the normal thing, which is to go through and you, know, you didn't need a ceiling, you just left it at the bottom of the floor above. Just give yourself a little ceiling to stick the lights to, and then you'll be okay. Yeah? So now isn't it just, if it's a sloped roof, isn't it just floating? It is just floating. You are absolutely correct. So what you got to do next is as follows. See if I can get the ceiling. I actually have it right there. Oops, come on you. Ceiling. Let me take a look at its properties. It has a height above the floor. OK, so what you got to basically do now is, in an elevation view, figure out what height you have to raise it to <laughs> to kind of get it up to whatever you need to be. So if you have a flat surface, that'll be relatively easy. If you have a sloping surface, you're going to have to sort of tweak them one at a time. OK, 
Okay, let us go ahead and let's say okay to that. Let's leave it, uh, yeah, let's leave it there for a minute. Let's go ahead and we'll stop here because where I am in this whole process is we've added the lights, you know, to supplement the daylight surfaces. We've placed them in the plan view. We've adjusted them a little bit, okay? And before I get back into the issue of rendering itself, let's take our break right here. So hop up, do your five minutes, stretch, stand. And when we come on back, we'll take a look at the issue of the sunlighting on the outside of the building and shadows and on the inside and how we get that to work with our lights. <laughs>